Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's GastroPlus user group webinar on understanding dermal drug disposition using TCAT, a novel PPPK model. Today, we have two presenters from a GlaxoSmithKline uh, uh, that, that are helping us with this topic. Uh, Dr. Valerio Damian is leading the Systems Modeling and Translational Biology Group in GlaxoSmithKline. And Dr. Anu Krishnatri is working currently as a clinical pharmacologist in the Clinical Pharmacology Modeling and Simulation Group at GlaxoSmithKline. Uh, the scientists at GlaxoSmithKline work with Simulations Plus to, de to, de to develop this novel transdermal compartmental absorption and transit model, and uh, we look forward to uh, their presentation uh, today. And with that, I'll turn it over to Valerio to start the presentation. Uh, thanks, Filipos. Uh, um, so, uh, thanks for the for for the introduction. So, indeed, uh, this is a uh, um, model that we uh, developed with uh, Simulations Plus uh, uh, a little while ago, and that started to get used within JSK and 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 uh, in other farmers as as well. So, um, as a as an introduction to this. It was interesting to note that one of the first applications of uh, PBPK uh, uh, modeling by the FDA was actually in uh, uh, for, for tretinoin, which is a, a, a topical cream. So it's interesting that you know that the, the, it started in the 1990s with uh, a, a transdermal product. And then you know all the efforts that went afterwards uh, um, in uh, looking at PDPK modeling and, and the impact that the PDPK modeling has had for oral IV uh, and, and other delivery routes kind of put the, the dermal uh, apart on the side until uh, uh, later, uh, you know, in, in the, in the 2000, 2010, 11, 12, when the uh, interest in developing a singular model for uh, um, uh, for, for gastroplasty sort to of re, uh, rekindle. So the, the, the next part is around uh, a, a brief motivation of why we want to include a, a, a dermal absorption model as part of a, a PDPK. And the, the, the simplistic assumption uh, that we have done actually internally you know, for a number of projects uh, previously, previous to having this, this kind of model, was to assume a very uh, simple situation. You have a dose that has, you know, you measure a flux through the skin, gets into the dermis, from there diffuse it into the systemic circulation from which you have the, the, the systemic clearance. But yet, if you are looking at the, the skin, it's a, it's a very complex organ structure, uh, which is not captured in a simple model like this. And moreover, the formulation starts uh, uh, being quite important for um, uh, transdermal um, uh, products. You know, you have ointments and creams and gels. And the if you just focus on a region of, of the skin there, hopefully you can see a little bit of the uh, uh, animation here. Uh, in, in this picture, you wanted to, to put on the very top the, the formulation, the epidermis, the dermis, the sweat glands, and so forth. If what you're interested in, it's a receptor here on the sweat gland, let's say, then the concentration of the drug, the gradient of concentration of the drug from the formulation all the way to the receptor, it's, it's quite pronounced. You have much more drug in the epidermis and much less or where, where you actually want it in the on the receptor at the base of the sweat gland. So trying to resolve this uh, uh, spatial dependency is, is critical. So this is actually a, 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 a data set that, that sort of prompted our um, uh, interest in developing a, a more detailed model for um, a, a transdermal is that you know we have one one of the compounds you have increased so what you see here is as a function of time you have accumulated 
uh, uh, cumulative amount from an in vitro testing. So you see very clearly that as you increase the uh, uh, concentration of your uh, of, of the drug, you have increased amount penetrating through uh, through the skin, and that's what you would expect. However, for a different compound, you have uh, again increasing concentration, but low concentration gives you low values as expected. Increasing the concentration beyond that a little bit gives you tremendous amount of, of uh, um, drug inside the skin, but then increasing it further reduces the amount going through the skin. And why is that? Because you know there is precipitation involved, there's evaporation. So all of those are things that affect drug uh, penetration through the skin and, and motivate why we actually need to uh, develop a more accurate model. And then the second component here is, is the um, uh, trying to deal in some ways with the, uh, the formulations. And you know you obviously have anything from the, uh, the gels and the, the uh, uh, ointments and, 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 and so forth. And what we started this year is to look at the uh, FDA classification for these. You have classification into liquid formulations, semi-solid formulations. Liquid can be either solutions uh, or suspensions um, or, or lotions. And then the um, uh, semi-solid uh, uh, formulations, depending on the um, amount of water and volatile compounds, can be classified either in gels, if you have uh, uh, a lot of uh, more than 50% uh, water and volatiles, or pastes. And then, you know, as a subcategory, you have ointments and you have creams. So all of these categories, solution, lotion, suspension, gel, cream, ointment, and paste, you have to have a way to deal with them, to model them, and, and understand the, the impact of the formulation in, uh, um, uh, in, in, in the delivery of drugs to the, the dermis. So with this in mind, this is the classification from the FDA, but how would you model something like this? And what we did next is to say, well, these are the exact same uh, uh, types of uh, uh, formulations, but the way that we can think from a modeling perspective is that you have a, um, a, a continuous phase and, you're, and, and the discrete, discrete phase. You have a vehicle for the continuous phase that can be either uh, liquid, gel, or semi-solid. What differentiates between them is the diffusivity of the, of the compound uh, in the continuous phase. You have a dispersed phase, and now it can be either a drug particle, an oil droplet, or a, a, a drug encapsulated in a, a polymeric particle, per se. And with that kind of um, a, a modeling viewpoint from a modeling perspective, continuous phase, dispersed phase, with choices in each one of them, then one can look at solutions as having the uh, continuous phase being liquid, and missing dispersed phase. Lotion is liquid vehicle and oil droplet for uh, the, uh, uh, the dispersed phase. Suspension, it's liquid vehicle and uh, the dispersed phase is a particle and so forth. Uh, uh, the, the gels and uh, all the others are, are basically, uh, for, uh, there is a representation of all the other formulations within this framework. And this is the framework that helps us design, uh, uh, design very well the, um, uh, you know, the modeling around uh, transdermal uh, delivery. So the, the, uh, let's see how, how something, a, a viewpoint like this works in, in, in practice. And I started with uh, perhaps a simple solution formulation. What can be simpler than that? Uh, if you have a, 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 a formulation like this, you probably have a, a, a fast evaporating components like uh, alcohols and the like. The, uh, the dots represent uh, um, the, the, the drug. You also have uh, um, slower volatile components, for, for instance, water. And then you also have probably some non-volatile component oils as part of the formulation. As you progress through, uh, through time, uh, the, uh, the fast evaporation um, uh, components of it are going to be uh, um, the, 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 the fast evaporations are going away. 
you are left with just the, the, the slower evaporation, but then the concentration in here in, in, this, in this vehicle has increased. Uh, as, as water continues to evaporate, you have less drug available. And the concentration of the drug in here may result in precipitation. And that is one of the explanations of why, you know, at very high concentration of, of drug, you are, you are less likely to see more penetration because you are losing a lot of drug through uh, uh, precipitation. And, and this is an example that, that shows that for different types of uh, uh, excipients, this um, uh, loss of weight from the formulation is actually uh, 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 real. So what I want to demonstrate with this is that even in the case where you start with a simple formulation, things are a little bit more complex and they need to be accounted properly in, in a model. So how does the model that uh, uh, we implemented uh, simulations plus implemented in uh, in uh, gastro plus. So as part of that, we looked at stratum cornea, viable epidermis, and dermis as diff distinct compartments. And moreover, in each one of them, there is a de de delineation. Each one of those compartments is subdivided in uh, uh, in, in different layers. So uh, on top of this, we looked at um, uh, the uh, formulation. So you have, as I mentioned before, a continuous phase. And what I uh, denoted here by the arrows, you have the, the drug that moves into the stratum cornea and diffuses through and gets absorbed uh, from, from the dermis into the systemic circulations marked with these sort of uh, uh, blue uh, arrows. Uh, there is the, the vehicle for the continuous phase that actually gets evaporated or some of it may get absorbed into systemic circulation. You have the dispersed phase that gets released, uh, that releases drug into the continuous phase. You also, we also have a, a, a film phase accounted for in the model for those situations where you want to model something, let's say like uh, a sunscreen, where you have coalescence of particles on a, on a, on a film phase. Um, and then you have to include not just the surface area of the skin that doesn't include any, any appendages. In, in principle, if you're looking at a, a, an image here, you have the uh, uh, appendages free type skin, you have the hair follicles, you have the sebum in here, and, uh, and, and the hair itself. So you want to account for these. So the way we deal with that is to look at the surface area um, of the skin here, the, the, the pink part, the surface, surface area of the uh, follicles, this part that would get formulation into the sebum, and then the surface area of the hair. So if you account for those, then you also have drug and uh, uh, vehicle that are moving from the formulation into the sebum through uh, and, and, and making making their way into the, uh, uh, the viable epidermis and similarly through, through the hair. So this is the structure of the uh, model as, as it is uh, implemented in, uh, in, in gastroplast. And obviously you have the rest of the skin uh, uh, available as well. So this is just the area in which you are, you are, you are dosing. So another complexity that uh, uh, we, uh, we have to deal with is trying to uh, encapsulate, uh, incorporate um, properties, physiological properties for the skin. And what's shown on the slides, it's basically the uh, various, uh, uh, you know, the, the stratum cornea thickness, which varies between the different regions in the human uh, skin, uh, the viable epidermis thickness, the dermis thickness, which is quite, quite dramatically different, uh, the blood flow rate, which is quite different again. So when, when we developed this model a couple of years ago, uh, the, the main physiology there was the human. Uh, now in 9.5, there is additional physiology that have been uh, uh, implemented as, as well. So once we have the model structured in place, once we have the physiological parameters in the same way as GastroPlus has tried to uh, predict or get started with some, some good predictions for diffusion coefficients, for uh, for all the drug uh, uh, dependent input parameters in every uh, compartment, we did the same thing trying to look at what 
choices are out there to, to get these kind of predictions. So for instance, for diffusion and partition uh, properties in the stratum cornea, there are multiple choices, multiple uh, publications out there that describe this. There is the, uh, uh, the Potts and Guy equations that have been used for quite some time now that give you a sense of diffusion and partition coefficients, Robinson's equations, and, and one that uh, we uh, uh, put it as a default the double, uh, uh, when casting a Nietzsche, uh, the, we call it a WKN uh, uh, equation which provides a more mechanistic explanation and also allows you to separate between um, hydrated or non-hydrated uh, uh, skin. And this is the one that's used by, by, by default uh, in GastroPlus, but you have choices to, to look at, at, at the others. Similarly, in the epidermis and dermis, you have uh, uh, different choices for looking uh, in, on the bottom for looking at the uh, partition coefficients and diffusion. And then you also have similar uh, uh, equations, the value equations for uh, diffusions of uh, drug and partitioning of drug into, into sebum. So um, this basically um, deals with the physiological parameters with respect to diffusion and partition, but you also need to deal with the absorption rate. And uh, uh, here again, we have two choices, either a, a simple uh, first order rate, which we found quite useful actually, as you know, if you, if you get a, a, an order of magnitude there, it's a, it's a quite easy way to, uh, to get started, or a more mechanistic uh, explanation of that from the uh, Ibrahim equations that you see described below. So um, this basically gives you a sense of what went into the development of the, uh, uh, the DCAT model. So from this point on, we're gonna switch a little bit and try to think about uh, what's actually needed, what's the modeling strategy that you want follows for a, uh, a, a new compound, a, a dermal compound. And this has the first, the first element there is to gather as with any other gastroplast model, you look at measure physchem, you predict if you can't measure it, um, uh, you, you measure properties of the drug, the compound, and, uh, um, and, and formulation. You start by modeling the IV dosing uh, so that you can get, uh, and this one is really just ACAT, this is modeling with using the, the, the GastroPlus uh, uh, software, you're modeling the IV and making sure you have the clearance uh, dealt with properly. And then for the, uh, uh, the transdermal part, one would look into the, um, the skin permeation model if available. Um, and and if, if this is available, then you, you would try to fine tune the predicted values for diffusion and uh, uh, partitioning in the various regions in the skin uh, to, to uh, calibrate those based on the uh, uh, in vitro data. And then obviously you can put the two together, the, the, the disposition and the clearance components with the in vitro permeation to get a sense uh, uh, of the, uh, you know, predicting clinical and predicting clinical with uh, the delivery of the drug in different areas of the skin and so forth. So um, I wanted to just uh, touch base just for a few minutes on the, uh, what I called the in vitro physiology. Uh, so basically what we mean by this is that the typical way that one studies the penetrations through, through skin is by having um, either a, a, a France static cell or throw through cells. Um, and for each one of them, in order to make use of the, the same GastroPlus uh, uh, software to actually fit properly the, the diffusion and the permeation uh, 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 partition parameters in the skin, one can set up a uh, an quote unquote in vitro physiology to mimic these in vitro systems. So, um, for instance, in the TCAT model, as you, you see there, the, um, uh, one can select the, uh, let's say, the abdomen skin physiology, adjust the thickness to match the, 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 the skin sample. So this is making sure that the skin that you're using in your in vitro matches uh, um, what, what you put in, into GastroPlus. Uh, remove the sebum uh, here. Uh, this is because once you are working with um, a skin samples, you are unlikely to still have 
uh, uh, sebum available after all that processing of the skin. Um, Sends very high systemic absorption rate. Why is this? Is that so it can get all of the, uh, uh, the you, you are basically trying to get the systemic compartment in uh, gastroplast to behave like the, uh, the uh, donor chamber in the in vitro setting. Um, and the, uh, you know, said no clearance so that the compound accumulates um, and, and the volumes need to match what you have in the in vitro settings. And, you know, in this case, for instance, you set fraction unbound so that, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, it matches what you used in the, uh, uh, in the receiving fluid or uh, match the volume of distribution with the uh, receptor uh, output volume. So this, these are basically things that one can do in, uh, uh, in, in the in gastroplus to actually allow you to uh, mimic what's happening in, in in vitro, and with that system in place, you can compare with the in vitro uh, 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 in vitro data. So basically, instead of just taking the in vitro flux and using that in a PVPK, you are you are validating the diffusion partition and absorption parameters, and and uh, uh, use these ones in a more uh, a detailed uh, PVPK uh, model. So um, this is the, the approach that we've taken for some compounds where, where this data was, was uh, available. But from this point on, I wanted to transition to Anu, who is basically going to be talking about how the model that we've implemented uh, in, uh, uh, in GastroPlus here um, was used in a in, in couple of uh, examples. So Anu, it's all yours at this point. Thanks, Valru. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, Valru gave a very nice overview of the TCAT model that we developed with Simulations Plus. I'm going to discuss first uh, two examples of the compounds which we used initially uh, to test this model uh, to check whether it's doing what uh, we hope it's doing, that it is differentiating between different formulation, the exposures seen systemically after topical administration of different formulations. Uh, in addition, I'm going to talk about one example of use of TCAT in an early development. Uh, as Valru mentioned, the TCAT model is available now in GastroPlus in versions 9 and up. So the new users can actually, um, like any other uh, GastroPlus model, you can uh, first of all pick the appropriate dosage forms. Uh, you have options, uh, as Valru showed, and uh, the FDA formulation, either pick uh, a simple liquid formulation like solutions, uh, lotions, or suspensions, or you can pick semi-solid uh, formulations like gels, creams, lotions, or paste. And uh, for other, like other extravascular routes, your routes, you can go to the modules optional and then go on and click the additional dosage routes. Uh, pick the transdermal route, and when you click it uh, on it, uh, click on the view editor on, then it opens up this window. On this, uh, you actually uh, see the structure of the model, which uh, is implemented in GastroPlus. You see the different compartments. You have hair uh, follicles, sebum compartment, subcutaneous tissue, and also accounting for the what's going into the systemic tissue. Hopefully, with the examples that I show in the next few slides, you'll get a flavor of how to use this model. Uh, this slide actually shows you the overall processes that uh, Valru also discussed that needs to be considered when you're trying to understand the dermal drug disposition. Uh, the simple approaches uh, which have been used so far for modeling skin permeation are based on simple calculations like log P or molecular weight. As you heard earlier from Valru, these approaches completely ignore the formulation effects. So you're considering the flux the same no matter what kind of formulation you are using. However, you need to account for the correct rate and, rate and extent from each of these formulations. And all these processes are important to understand the release or dissolution of the drug and the competing processes like evaporation of the formulation, the precipitation, and ultimately accounting from what, what's getting it absorbed in the stratum cornea. 
further, you need to understand uh, the various processes in different layers uh, or the different compartments which are modeled uh, in the TCAT model to ultimately understand what's getting in the systemic circulation to account for either the efficacious effects or the tox effect then you're trying to understand what's in the different skin sub layers so that you can understand either the tox effects or the efficacy of your drug so today I'm going to talk about uh, these three examples. Uh, first, um, different formulations of clindamycin and tizarotene. And one of the internal compounds uh, at GSK that I'm calling co uh, Compound X for this presentation. Uh, the first example is for clindamycin. Uh, let me first give the background of this compound. Uh, I have the structure on the right-hand side of this slide for the chemists in the audience. Uh, clindamycin is a lincosamide antibiotic. It's uh, widely used to treat infections, especially the anaerobic bacterial infections. It's commonly used for treatment of acne. Uh, typically, uh, for an IV administration, it's given as clindamycin phosphate, uh, which is converted to clindamycin in for plasma. Uh, so I looked into the literature and we found two uh, studies that were done with uh, clindamycin. So we had one publication from Gatti et al., which was published in 1993, which had both IV and oral exposure information uh, in healthy male volunteers with average body weight of 73 kilos. Also, we had another study by Placence et al., which was done back in 1989, where repeat dose administration, IV infusion, was given for clindamycin. So this was useful information to characterize the disposition. Also, in addition to that, we had internal GSK data on four different clindamycin formulation, ranging from a simple solution formulation called Dallas and T solution or to gel formulation, Duag gel or Clinda gel, and one of the foam formulation, Evoclin foam. So we asked this question whether the TCAT model can predict exposure from these different formulations. So let's see what all information is needed for the TCAT model to understand the exposures in the skin. Uh, the interest here is to understand using this novel PBPK model to predict for dermal formulation how much drug is entering in a specific skin sublayer or uh, where you are interested. For example, you are interested in dermis or where you are observing your toxicity. So to minimize those exposure, you're trying different formulations. So what all information is needed to build a TCAT model? Um, so to build a TCAT model, like any other PBPK model, you need to understand the compound details, uh, details of the formulations, and also the study details. It's important to understand the compound details like lipophilicity, solubility, permeability, binding, and systemic disposition. Uh, in addition, you really need uh, some of the formulation details like the type of formulation to pick the appropriate dosage form from the model, and then it is modeled differently. And other formulation details like volatile components, uh, their evaporation rate, volume, API solubility in the, uh, for excipients as well. You need to understand how the study was performed. So where was the formulation applied? As you saw in the earlier slide that Valru showed, depending on where the uh, which type of skin there might be differences in the skin thickness and also the blood flow and appropriate skin physiology is implemented in the model uh, you need to understand or get the information about the application surface area to understand the dose which was administered other aspect which is important is to see whether the skin was occluded or not whether it was covered or not because depending on uh, the occlusion, it can affect the hydration and different uh, calculation methods are used to uh, calculate the diffusivity. Uh, and the inform other information, like if you are uh, performing any washing step, what that is telling you, how long is the formulation there at the uh, skin surface, which is available for absorption into the skin. So tip, uh, I think the default in the TCAT model is zero hours, which says the formulation stays there forever, but you can change it depending on what study was performed. Uh, bonuses, if you have in vitro flux data, uh, which can be used to understand or optimize the flux early on to understand what's happening in the mini pig before you start going uh, go to go and model the human uh, skin data, human uh, predict for human PK. 
So let's see where we got this information for the clindamycin TCAT model. For most of the compound details for clindamycin, we either use the experimental data wherever available, or we predicted it using the ADMET predictor uh, implemented in GastroPlus. Uh, we had, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we had two studies um, which were available, which we used to characterize the systemic disposition of clindamycin. Uh, for formulation details, we had, I used the appropriate uh, physiology uh, dosage form based on the different formulations. I incorporated different uh, information about the volume, the solvent evaporation rate, uh, volatile components to account for the solvent evaporation rate. Also, other information about these formulations was included in the model, which included the volume, dose, and also information about the API solubility in the formulation. What other details were included were the dosing, uh, the information about where the um, dosage forms were applied, what was the application surface area, and whether the skin was occluded or not, a washing step was performed. Uh, as Valu discussed earlier, there are several published mathematical relationships uh, which, can, which are implemented in this model to calculate diffusivity and partition coefficients to various skin compartments. For example, stratum corneum. Uh, in this first screenshot on the top, you see there are four different methods, either the default method, which is the WKN method, um, which was mentioned earlier by Valru and Potson Kai or Robinson method, or users can also input their own uh, values. Similarly, for viable epidermis, there are four different methods to calculate diffusivity, which includes Crestos, Bungee Creek, Robinson, or user can use their own values. For sebum, you can either use Valvati method or uh, input your own values. In case of clindamycin model, I use the default calculation methods for diffusivity. And these values are actually used to calculate the permeability by multiplying with the partition coefficient and dividing by the skin layer thickness. The model actually gives you the flexibility to also pick the number of sublayers in various compartments like stratum corneum, viable epidermis, or dermis for computational purposes. User can pick up to 20 different uh, layers, sublayers. And also, user can specify the grid subtype, which can be either uniform, increasing, or distribution. Uh, I picked in this example 10 uh, sublayers uh, to have a balance between accuracy and computational speed with uh, uniform grid type. After including all the details about the compound formulation and study as discussed, the calculated values of diffusivity and partition coefficient, as I mentioned, I used the default values. Uh, we, we optimized two different parameters, which included the vehicle water partition coefficient or the systemic uptake rate uh, from the dermis into the circulation. Actually, even for the vehicle water partition coefficient was calculated, we could get an initial estimate using the lipophilicity and other parameters uh, to use as a good initial estimate. And uh, for the um, systemic uptake rate, as uh, Valru also mentioned, you can also use the more mechanistic method, Ibrahim's method, and the optimized value was very close to similar to what uh, Ibrahim method was predicting in this case. So we, uh, as I mentioned, we had these two IVs, PK studies uh, from the literature. So we digitized this data uh, using the digited software from Simulations Plus which was used for modeling uh, and characterizing the PK uh, systemic exposure. This slide shows the model fits for the PK data. I used a simple two compartment model to characterize the observed plasma concentration time profiles well from three um, IV infusion data sets that were available. Uh, I wanted to add that uh, the doses in these simulations were adjusted to pre-clindamycin as clindamycin phosphate was dosed, uh, but it quickly converts to clindamycin in plasma, so we modeled clindamycin. And uh, for the um, this, um, we uh, also have input the, all the information about different formulations. As you see, we had a different variety of formulation. We had two formulation, which were single dose administrations, and two were multiple dose administration. And the screenshot here shows you uh, some of the information that needs to be included for the formulation, like I mentioned earlier, uh, your dose and also the, uh, the dosage volume, application surface area, et cetera. Uh, after including all the information uh, for the compound, 
details and formulation and study details and characterizing the PK, we simulated four clindamycin formulation, which are shown on this slide. As you can see, the model was able to characterize the systemic exposures from these four formulations pretty well. The open square here shows the observed data. The bars are actually the CV persons and the lines are the simulated plasma concentration time profiles. Uh, one advantage of the PBPK model is that once you have got your systemic profiles characterized well, as compared to the observed data, what you can do is you can go back and try to look at the exposures in various skin compartments, say dermis, if that's what you're interested in. The TCAT model gives you an option to plot concentrations or amounts in most of these compartments by picking a new plot option and specifying the option. So if you see on this uh, screenshot, you can go to the dermal option and you can pick uh, the concentration and exposures and also uh, the dissolved or undissolved amount in the vehicle compartment. So the profile on the top, uh, the plot shows um, how we simulated the concentrate the simulated concentration of clindamycin in various layers or the different skin compartments at different uh, time points so you can see uh, four different compartments here the vehicle stratum corneum viable epidermis and dermis um, and the sub 10 sub layers which were used in the model so as early as zero hours, you see most of the drug is still sitting in the uh, vehicle, but as the time progresses 20 by 24 hours, most of it is gone and it's slowly permeating through various layers of the skin. Uh, what was interesting was uh, we saw, uh, on, if you see on the right hand side plot, which shows a dissolved concentration in the sebum, we saw from all these four formulation, the drug was getting into sebum at different levels. That intuitively actually makes sense because uh, this compound drug is effective against acne bacteria, and that might be um, and it's uh, that might be the reason why it is effective. But is it true, or it is one of the artifacts of the model? So I looked into the literature to see if that behavior has been reported somewhere, and actually find an internal study that was done by GSK colleagues at uh, Stiefel, which was presented at uh, American Academy of Dermatology back in 2010. The study was done using a radio labeled clindamycin in mice, and they saw actually as early as one hour um, after application of the clindamycin gel, some accumulation was seen around sebaceous glands. Also, after four hours of application uh, clindamycin gel, there was a clear accumulation in the sebaceous glands. Also, uh, I found another study in Journal of Clin Farm, uh, which was uh, published in 1972, where clindamycin was given orally uh, and it suggested high sebum levels. This gave us some confidence that the model is able to differentiate between different formulations of clindamycin and guiding the exposures in various skin compartments uh, correctly. The next model uh, compound that we modeled was uh, tazarotene that I'm going to talk now. It's a retinoid compound. Uh, it's a prodrug uh, that is quickly metabolized by esterases to its active metabolite, uh, which is a more water soluble form called tazarotinic acid. Uh, for this compound, we had uh, IV, human IV infusion data available uh, for tazarotene. And in addition, we have internal data for two different formulations, which was tazarotene gel and a Fabior foam formulations. So just like clindamycin, um, we gathered the information about the compound, formulations, and the study details to start building this model. And uh, similar to clindamycin, use the default diffusivity and partition coefficient calculations. And uh, I use 10 sublayers and a uniform grid uh, for each of these compartments. Uh, at this point, we optimized two parameters, again, similar to clindamycin, uh, use some of the initial guesstimates to calculate the vehicle water partition coefficient as a starting point for this optimization, and uh, the kinetic first order um, uh, uptake rate from the systemic circulation from the derm, uh, into systemic circulation from dermis. This uh, slide shows the PK uh, characterization of the PK IV data, which was available. And as you can see, the com simple compartmental model fit was, uh, 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 was able to characterize the plasma concentration data pretty well. And this was used further to uh, simulate the concentrations for the uh, clinical study with the tazarotene gel and the foam formulation. 
um, you see this model was able to predict uh, uh, both these formulations pretty well. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about um, uh, one of the examples of use of TCAT in early drug development. So, you know, uh, very early on, one of the questions that typically teams are asking us is, um, if you, uh, can you use this sophisticated uh, novel uh, PCAT model to predict systemic exposures upon topical administration to understand the tox or uh, effects or efficacy and predict the human doses? So early on in the development, one typically have the in vitro skin penetration and distribution information from in vitro assays, either uh, with a static system like a France diffusion cell or dynamic systems like flow through cells, as you saw in earlier slides as well. To begin understanding skin permeation, I used the in vitro skin penetration and distribution study information that I had available from the team from a France diffusion cell. So basically, you have a dermatomed uh, human skin samples, which are sandwiched between a donor compartment and a receiver compartment. And the formulation is added on the top, as shown in this figure, uh, on the donor side. And samples are uh, taken from the receiver fluid over a period of time. Uh, the typical uh, results from these uh, studies include um, the measurement of cumulative amount released over a period of time as shown in this uh, top plot uh, the team was uh, comparing two different formulation the one shown in a red and a blue formulation here labeled as formulation one and two and we had observed these concentration over a period of 24 hours so this that's a typical behavior for the cumulative amount uh, plot where oh, for the first few hours you don't see drug getting through the into the receiving fluid because of the barriers of the stratum corneum and then you start seeing drug getting into the receiving fluid at the end of the experiment typically what's done is the skin uh, is harvested and the layer sub layers are, are separated to understand the drug exposure in different uh, layers of the skin which is shown on the bottom plot on uh, the histogram where you have the concentration in the stratum corneum, epidermis, and dermis from these two formulations. So just like uh, we discussed for the previous two examples, to build the TCAT model, you need the basic information about the compound, formulation details, and the study detail. This is the in vitro data that I was modeling. So I tried to simulate the conditions for the France diffusion cell study. I use predicted compound properties like log P, PK, and use experimental data which was available for protein binding, etc. Uh, the formulation used for this in vitro study was a simple solution, and I obtained the details about those formulations uh, from the team as well. And this is uh, the slide which Valu showed earlier, where you, what we are trying is to use the TCAT model to mimic the in vitro studies to validate the diffusion and partition parameter that can be used in the TCAT uh, model. So basically, uh, with the France diffusion cell data, which I had, uh, I tried to match with the TCAT model. So for example, in the in vitro study, we have shaved skin, so you know, and not much of sebum. So you're removing that component. You're matching the skin type, which is human abdomen physiology was selected in this case. You're matching the skin thickness in the study, which, was, which is usually available from these experiments. In addition, I also had this information about formulation solubility for this compound X in different excipients, which are used to calculate the uh, formulation solubility. And it also is useful because it gives you information about the solubility in the residual solvent that is used in the model as well. For example, in this case, most of it will be PEG 400. So th this plot, uh, slide shows the simulated data for the cumulative amount permeated. So just to orient you here in the plot, you're trying to simulate, the red line shows the simulated profile, what you would observe in a receiving fluid when you're uh, putting the uh, formulation on top of the skin. And the blue diamond shows the observed data we have uh, obtained from the CRO for compound X. Then I looked into the exposures into uh, in the as different layers of the skin, the stratum corneum and the combined exposure in the viable epidermis and dermis. The blue line shows the simulations and the red diamond shows the observed data. 
using this in vitro experiment, as I said, it's a good step for any of those uh, it's, uh, your compound modeling because it gives you an idea of the flux to different skin layers, which can be used to further uh, use for either you are modeling the in vivo mini pig skin data or go start uh, modeling the human PK data. But what was bothering me in this case was uh, in order to match what was seen in the receiving fluid and also to uh, match exposures in the layers of the skin, I had to change certain skin diffusion parameters in various layers. At this point, I contacted the experts uh, in the field to discuss and understand the experiment further that I was used for this modeling purposes. It became apparent that uh, the in vitro study that was performed by CRO used certain non-physiological conditions that may have led to those high exposures. They used a lot of ethanol in the receiving fluid. Uh, it's okay for the early these uh, studies in the early development if you're just comparing uh, two different formulations for ranking purposes. But in my case, I was using this data to quantitatively assess the skin and systemic exposures for toxicity and the dose prediction purposes. So the team actually went on to repeat the experiment internally with a flow through cell with more physiological conditions that gave the expected results which were in line with the TCAT model. So it's very important like in any other modeling work to understand first uh, the data being used for the modeling so that you get reliable results out of your model to make informed decisions. And also um, it's a good uh, to question your experimental design as well before you are going to change your model. Uh, hopefully you got some flavor of the TCAT model uh, which is uh, implemented in uh, GastroPlus with the three examples that I presented today. Uh, there's a lot of additional information about the model in the manual as well uh, that I will recommend new users to look into. And also there's some examples as well that you can look as well. And the, uh, the first two examples that I presented today were developed in very early versions of TCAT and there are many more changes and updates to Biosimulations Plus as well in recent versions. It will be good uh, for the Gastro Plus users to share more examples of TCAT applications and further learn from each other so that we can enhance capabilities of this model in future. Um, to conclude my uh, talk for today, uh, the clindamycin uh, model was able to appropriately characterize exposure differences with different formulation ranging from simple solutions or gels or foam. Similarly, the model was uh, predicted the exposures from both gel and foam formulation of tazeratin with reasonable accuracy. Um, the TCAT model is a novel model that can be used to understand exposures at different stages of drug development uh, as early as candidates or pre candidate selection and finding uh, the formulation decisions to maximize the potential for right amount of drug to be delivered at the target tissues in the body. Uh, some of the future challenges uh, for this model is to further validate it for various database of excipients so that we can also understand and simulate the interplay of drug and excipients. Also include other physiology like uh, different disease conditions, different ages of skin and also uh, the skin um, surface roughness. Um, at this point, uh, several folks have contributed to development of this model. Uh, that include current and previous GSK and Stiefel colleagues. I would like to really thank them for this uh, contribution. Also, big thanks for sim to Simulations Plus for this collaboration. We also have Vera and Jessica from Simulations Plus online today to address any specific questions you may have for recent upgrades or any other suggestions you have. Um, at this, uh, I would like to thank all the participants for their attention. We will now take questions that have been submitted via chat. So th thank you for the presentation. Uh, uh, as Anu just mentioned, uh, you can now submit questions um, uh, via the, uh, the question uh, interface on the GoToMeeting uh, that we have already received a couple of them and uh, I'll just start going uh, through them uh, and you know please, please keep submitting questions. Uh, so the, the first question that was asked was um, can one select multiple dosing regions at the same time for a simulation? 
So um, the the answer to that is uh, at, at this point uh, it's it's no. Uh, you can only select one uh, one dosing region uh, for, uh, for for the simulation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so second question. Uh, uh, I believe in the in the list of input parameters that uh, I know you were showing. Uh, you had listed biorelevance solubility. And the question is, uh, what is the relevance of biorelevance solubility in the TCAT model? Because when you're trying to understand the ACAT models, in some of the cases, you will be using the PBPK model. So those things are useful once you have the drug systemically to characterize it better. Uh, also, I would I would add to that that uh, <clears throat> what Anu showed a, a little earlier is that once you want to understand a particular formulation, you need to understand the solubility of your compound in the various components of the formulation, and ideally in various uh, uh, percentages, uh, you know, various composition mixtures of, uh, of 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 those ingredients, because that would define what's happening in the in the formulation on, on the skin surface. So, to me, that actually is is one of the, the critical pieces in uh, understanding the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the transdermal penetration. Great, thank you. Um, uh, uh, one question of the equations that were discussed, uh, what are the specific utilities of the different modeling equations in the TCAT model? Um, but I guess to, to, to ask differently, how does one choose what, what model to use for this? So I will I will uh, take a, a, a stab at it and, and basically you know just as with uh, a lot of the other uh, choices that were done in GastroPlus for uh, uh, modeling partition coefficients for for instance uh, KPs KP values there are multiple choices and and they reflect the state of the knowledge that exists in the literature at, at the time that the model was built as more examples uh, uh, come through you sort of um, that there, there's going to be a consensus to what, what works best. So far, the default choices work quite well for us, but that's not to say that in, in, in other situations, uh, different choices may actually work, uh, uh, work, work better. That's why they're there, actually. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is around, uh, uh, if, if, you, if the presenters could comment on the relevance of the mini pig model in predicting topical human exposure? Yeah, I'll answer that. So, for the what I meant by using the mini pig data is typically what you do, uh, you, mini pig skin is very, it has some similarities and some dissimilarities with the human skin. With the in vitro uh, skin data, which is usually available as the first line of information for understanding the permeation, what's missing is the systemic uptake and a lot of the other parameters like hair follicle absorption and uh, perme uh, sebum uh, involvement. But that's the first piece of information when you're doing in an in vivo study in a mini pig, trying to understand the in vivo uh, exposures from a formulation before you go in for a human study. It's like any other oral studies. You are doing the studies in the preclinical models before you're going get a more more uh, idea, a more understanding of your formulations and your uh, compound before you get into the human. Okay, thank you. Um, so some somewhat related question. Um, has there been consideration uh, uh, given to the use of uh, uh, um, um, mouse or rat skin in vitro for flux assessment? Uh, I'll ask. Um, I think uh, Vera can address probably if we have the. I think we we have the minipic physiology implemented in the GastroPlus latest version. I'm not sure if you have murine physiology at this point. We, yeah, yes, we do have uh, in version 9.5, the um, added physiologies uh, include rat and mouse physiology as well. Um, so we do have you know, physiological parameters for those, but um, um, I don't think in terms of translating the data, it has not been validated yet in, in terms of translating the in vitro parameters measured through those. But we do have the physiology included. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. Um, the, the, one question is around, uh, can this model be used for uh, toxicological, for toxicologic parameter for long-term usage? So you can definitely do simulations for longer term usage. That's not the problem. You can do uh, repeat dosing and, uh, and, and all of that. Now in terms of um, uh, changes, uh, toxicological changes uh, induced in the skin as a result of applying the drug, we're not accounting. I mean, the model doesn't account for, uh, for, for, for that element. If, you, if the question refers to the uh, 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 the, the permeations of drug in diseased skin, then I would say for that, if we looked at uh, uh, changing the physiological parameters in the skin to reflect the uh, disease uh, physiology, uh, and, and you, you can definitely do that in the, uh, in, in, in the model. Okay, thank you. Um. Uh, there is one question on the uh, tazarotin uh, example. Uh, what was the uh, vehicle water coefficient? And uh, is there an in vitro method uh, recommended for determining uh, such parameters? It's basically the partitioning of the tazarotin uh, from the vehicle in, uh, and, and the water. So it's partition coefficient. I don't know, uh, the in vitro method, what I'm suggesting is you have the lipophilicity information and solubility in various excipients that used, was used to calculate this value. Thank you. And um, also, if your vehicle is immiscible in water, you can actually measure this directly in the lab. It's pretty straightforward. Okay. Thank you. Um, there's a clarification question uh, requested here. It, uh, the question is that in the model that was shown, uh, there is lymphatic uptake from the subcutaneous compartment to the, and not the dermis compartment. So is that correct? So uh, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll get started, but uh, probably uh, Vera or Jessica can further comment on this because I think that the uh, uh, subcutaneous compartment was added to be able to uh, provide some uh, compatibility further for uh, subcutaneous delivery of, of drug where lymphatics is quite important. It's not to say that lymphatics is not there in the in the dermis, but uh, given the, um, I mean, this is my interpretation to the question, given the, the for small molecule, the lymphatic absorption from dermis is, is much smaller than the uh, uh, absorption via, via systemic. So I think it wouldn't make a difference for um, some. Okay. Um, any co co comments, Viera, from you? Then you know you want to have that in to allow you. Uh, Well, you, 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 you were breaking a little bit uh, on this response, um, maybe something with the phone. Ho hopefully most people got uh, it. Should I try? Okay. I, I was just uh, uh, basically saying that if uh, uh, Viera or Jessica can comment further on, on this, but the, the, the bulk of the, 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 the response was that uh, lymphatic is, is there to allow subcutaneous delivery, and it was there primarily for large molecules. You. Yeah, that's correct. So for the small molecules, we don't expect lymphatic to be a, um, a significant route um, in the dermis, definitely. And um, I think usually people don't inject biologics into the dermis. So we were, as, um, as Valerio said, we were primarily thinking about, you know, injecting biologics into the subcutaneous. And that's really the main reason why we put the lymphatic uptake there. Thank you for the clarification. Um, uh, there is a there is a question uh, for the presented case studies. Uh, could you please comment uh, if the exposure across the different skin layers was validated by mass balance? Uh, is that mean by uh, experimental data or modeling? It's not, I'm not sure if it's that. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm guessing experimental data, the way it reads. 
I, we didn't have those uh, imaging data for this compound, these compounds, any of these compounds. Yeah, so on, on the modeling side, obviously you have the mass balance, yeah. but on the on the experimental, uh, it's it's not you don't you don't usually have that uh, uh, that level of detail, or not always. Okay, thanks. Uh, there's a question: uh, Can can the model uh, accommodate structural change in the skin due to the needle for injection applications? Um, okay, my, my first reaction was there, well, we're talking about the transdermal, but, you know, if you're talking about microneedle type uh, uh, delivery there, um, you could potentially account for it by changing, changing the, uh, you know, uh, the hair follicle, so mimicking that as, as, as hair follicles, but it's, it, it's a stretch. I mean, this is not, it was not intended to, to model, um, uh, a tra transdermal uh, through, you know, injection delivery, a microneedle type delivery. So that's, it, yeah, that's that's kind of the the answer there. Uh, it's, it's, I'm sure that one can think about ways to to uh, uh, simulate that with, with, within the current system. But at least I'm we we haven't done it. I'm not aware of of, of that. Um, okay, let me see. Lost track. Uh, so, in, in both examples, uh, uh, the PK validation was using compartmental modeling. Uh, can you comment on which exact model component are based on PPK from skin dosing? Is it just the absorption side that uh, that's being simulated through PPK in the example shown? So the PPPK part is the TCAT model where you have different components of the skin in this case and everything else is like the abridged version of ACAT for any systemic and compartmental model. Um, if there's a question, uh, can the PPPK model uh, be used to predict uh, PK in delicate skin areas, uh, for example, genital areas or uh, anal areas? For those applications, I don't think that we have those uh, uh, areas sort of detailed specifically as you know just drop downs to, to be able to select that that kind of physiology there. So I think that for that purpose, one would need to look into the details of the skins in those areas and and define that physiology. It's possible to do so. It's just that it's not a, a available as a drop down. There's a couple of related questions. Uh, can the model, uh, or how does one put in the model effects of excipients on skin barrier, for example, penetration enhancers? Um, so um, it's it's one area that uh, uh, you know, if you if you want to be able to predict everything without any kind of optimization, that that. This is going to require a little bit more uh, work in the future. But if you know that you have a penetration enhancer, for instance, you would uh, obviously modify or uh, the, the diffusion coefficient that is calculated by any of those methods. And and uh, if you have any kind of experimental value, you would modify them. You would optimize them to actually get uh, a match for the in vitro um, uh, data that you have generated. Similarly, uh, depending on what other excipients you may have and the reasons why they are there, uh, you can either increase the, uh, uh, you know, the, the diffusion properties of the, um, uh, of, of the compound, the, the solubilities. Uh, so you, you can change those kind of properties in the, in the vehicle, in the formulation to account for the presence of the of various excipients. Okay. And, and, and I guess as a follow-up, I, I guess in principle, if someone was to run these experiments in vitro that you do, you 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 showed, I guess one can use those experiments to fit some of these parameters. Will you, will you think that's that, that is correct? That is correct. Yes, for now. Yep. Um, there is a question of whether the current TCAT model has any skin metabolism effects. Uh, Taken into uh, consideration? 
Uh, yes and no. <laughs> so the yes part is that there is a metabolism uh, a tab there where, you, where if you know the uh, uh, extension and the, the, the type of, of metabolism, what, what enzymes are responsible for it, you can put it in and then it's, it's accounted in the model. But there is no easy way that one can um, identify what metabolism is going to happen in the uh, in the skin and, and predict that from, from structure in an easy way. Again, Viera or, or Jessica, if you want to comment or add to this. Yeah, so I, I think uh, Valerie already um, answered that. Um, the, um, the capability is there. You have option to add the metabolism in the skin, but you have to be able to parameterize it in terms of deciding which enzyme is, uh, is um, um, clearing the compound, what is the expression of that enzyme in the in the skin, or at least be able to enter a linear intrinsic clearance in, in the skin. So um, we, we don't have a way of predicting it. You would have to be able to provide the parameters to the model. But the, the equations and the capabilities there, we just uh, don't have them, don't have a way of predicting them from structure. Uh, there's another question. Like, can one use the TCAT model to simulate uh, uh, subcutaneous dosing? So, strictly. Let's, let's put the dose directly into the subcutaneous area, yeah. Maybe, uh, I, can answer, maybe I can answer that one. Um, yes, there is a capability of doing administration into the subcutaneous uh, tissue. Um, you can do injection of. Um, either immediate or controlled release formulations subcutaneously. Thank you. Um, uh, is there any link of the skin tissue in the full BBBK model with the TCAT model? Uh, yes. Um, I mean, uh, it's, it's a bit unclear. So just to, to, to uh, uh, repeat there, so when, when you have the uh, the can model in place. It allows the delivery of, of the drug through the skin to be modeled explicitly. But at the same time, if, if one chooses to use the full PVPK model, there is a skin compartment in, in, in the PVPK model as well. Uh, and that would be representative of the, uh, if you want, undosed portion of the skin. Thank you. Um... How, how do you predict the effect of precipitation and evaporation? So, uh, you know, precipitation in, in general, it's, it's actually, uh, it's, it's modeled quite uh, nicely in, in, uh, in, in gastroplast and is the same mechanism that it used here. The, the, the trick for both of these situations is to understand what the solubility is in the, uh, um, um, in those uh, environments. So this is primarily, uh, the, the, the situation that's happening in the, in the formulation is some of the, the vehicle either disappears because of the evaporation or gets absorbed through the skin. So you have less, you know, the composition of the, uh, of the formulation changes uh, after the uh, uh, initial application. Uh, the evaporation, there, there's uh, specific equations that they'll deal with that. Uh, and uh, obviously, the, the, the way that we have dealt with modeling uh, uh, different different formulations there is to actually look very careful at the, uh, the different ingredients, excipients that, that are part of the formulation and look at their individual potential to evaporate. Okay, thank you. Um, there, there is a general question that in several slides, uh, the drug concentrations in the dermis are higher than the epi in the epidermis. Is that is that correct and why why is that the case as a general observation higher concentration in dermis compared to epidermis yeah well, that's what the question reads <laughs> we just presented one of the examples the last example had the dermis exposures but they're like what does the uh, experimental data and that's what is predicted i'm not sure if i understand correctly Okay. Well, maybe if someone, if the, those who submit the question, maybe you can re restate the question. Maybe we can try to respond. That. So, in, but in, in general, the the amount of, of drug there depends on both the um, uh, partition coefficient in those tissues and also the fact that you have uh, uh, absorption in, in the in the systemic. 
uh, circulation from, uh, uh, from, from, from dermis. Um, and, and typically, you tend to see much more drug into the stratum cornea than you do into the dermis uh, and the uh, uh, epidermis. Um, there's another question. Can we model if the drug is absorbing uh, through sweat pores? And which compartment do we need to consider in those cases? Uh, so there is a capability in the model to look at uh, absorption through uh, uh, sweat pores. Uh, so it's a sebaceous uh, um, through, through, through sebum. Um, and you know you just have to activate it. I think by default it's active. Um, so to be specific, um, kind of the alternate route that we have is going to be the sebum that's going to be surrounding the hair follicles. We don't have an explicit compartment for the sweat pores, but if you do know that your drug is going to be absorbed through sweat and that's going to be significant, then what you can do is kind of hijack that sebum compartment you know, and change it so that it has more similar parameters to the sweat pores. So that would be kind of the workaround. So um, from our side, the problem is that it can be kind of difficult to distinguish, okay, is this really going through sebum or going through sweat? So we end up just having kind of one alternate route. Thank you. Uh, I think that's probably one of the last questions. Uh, can, uh, the in can in vitro dissolution data be used by any means in transdermal uh, modeling? Uh, it's it's uh, yes, but it needs to be done very carefully because you you are trying to to do any an, an in vitro dissolution and try to mimic the, uh, the the same processes as you know some of the excipients in in the in vivo go through skin, some get evaporated. Those are processes that are much harder to capture in, a, in an in vitro experiment. So in, in vitro dissolution. So. It's it's it can inform, but I, I I don't know that you can easily use that directly. Okay. Oh, there's one last question. I'll try to read it. Uh, I'm 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 personally not fully understanding the question, but maybe maybe you guys will understand. So the the question is, uh, the in vitro permeation data uh, are inclusive of what's happening to the drug molecules from the vehicle. Uh, like release precipitation, uh, et cetera, into the different skin layers. Um, does gastroplast have a function to give estimates of compound properties, for example, log P, permeability, protein binding? If a user feeds in in vitro data with some information about the skin membrane used for the experiment, Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm having a little bit of trouble here. So I think that what the question there is, is if you have um, in vitro data for, for the skin, can you back calculate compound properties? Um, and, and if that's the question, then the answer is probably no. Uh, I mean, you, you kind of go the other way around with starting with, with, with the compound structure and, 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 and properties uh, um, and, and then sort of fine tune uh, some of the uh, uh, permeation parameters to match the in vitro and then the in vivo. Am I, uh, is, am I interpreting correctly the, uh, the question? Maybe I can, I can follow up on, on that a little bit. Um, so the gastroplast does have capability uh, of predicting some of these properties from structure, right? Predicting log P, predicting protein binding and so on. And uh, in terms of linking the um, deconvolution of in vitro data into different processes, let's say diffusivities and partition coefficients in different skin layers. Um, I think in uh, the examples in, um, or at least in theory section, I can remember which, in which part of the presentation it was, um, Valerio and Anu did um, highlight the option of using this model to fit those parameters to your in vitro data. So again, you would link, you would model the in vitro data with this more mechanistic model by accounting for the basic physical properties of log P, permeability, and so on, 
to deconvolute those specific parameters for feeding into in vivo model like partition coefficients and defensivities through different skin layers. So through the combination of different um, ways of inputting uh, parameters, you would be able to um, to figure out these parameters. Great, thank you, um, Gerardo. Um, I guess I have one last question um, from, from from my side. So, um, especially in the compound uh, X example uh, that I remember because it's the most recent one. Um, the, the variability on the in vitro data was significant for some of the measurements, while I mean we were, you were showing the mean profiles fitted uh, to those. I was wondering, have you tried to take the in vitro variability, fit that, and then see if that variability translates in vivo? Uh, for in vivo predictions, uh, because in that case, we are just predicting what's happening with the in vitro system uh, scenario with TCAT. We are not predicting anything in vivo. And as I mentioned earlier, these are like uh, studies which are done early on in the uh, screening stage that was available and team was pushing to get more information about the dose predictions and make more uh, decisions based on that information which already as you pointed had a lot of variability to begin with and the exposures the mean exposures and uh, i should have plotted the cv persons that as well was uh, in that range would i had to make huge changes to some of the skin physiologies to match that okay thank you um i, I think that's all for questions for today um, I'm sure if there are more questions uh, on this uh, uh, they can be submitted to simulations plus and uh, and I'm sure uh, Viera and Jessica uh, will be happy to uh, help with those uh, I will also ask you if you have questions uh, please use the LinkedIn uh, gas plus user group website and, and pause your questions there, and we'll, we'll also try to answer there. With that, I'd like to thank uh, our presenters, uh, uh, Valerio and uh, Anu, and uh, I think that concludes uh, our uh, live portion of this today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you.